Right, thank you very much. Um, I'm very appreciative. It is lunchtime, and yet you're all here. Um, so thank you for coming to listen to us. You've heard some compelling evidence about why we should warm our patients and not allow them to become hypothermic, and how, what is the best method to measure their temperature. I'm going to hopefully uh, describe to you a method of introducing um, a guideline or developing a guideline to introduce in your local practice if your fellow anesthesiologists and clinicians do not believe you. Um, there is enough evidence out there, so um, I think developing a guideline is a very straightforward, well, I thought it was a very straightforward thing to do in this field, how wrong I was. My name is Dr. Alexander. Um, I come from Worcester, Worcestershire Royal Hospital. You won't know us for research, fantastic research. You won't know us for having a, such a stunning hospital as the Cleveland. However, you will all know us, I'm sure, because we do produce a, if I can get this to advance, Come on, Thomas, help me out here. There we go. We do produce something that I'm, you all have used, I am sure, with your sausages. Worcestershire sauce, that comes from our town. So, declaration time. I was the, clinical, I was the chairman of the uh, development of the guideline that NICE produced, and this is what I'm going to talk about to you. Um, but, uh, as I say, I was the chairman. I am now a clinical advisor to the 3M Corporation uh, in this field. So what is NICE? NICE is, a, is an institution that was set up in 1999, uh, and its idea was to, it was, it was set up by the government at the time, to be independent upon, uh, from our state-run health system in the UK. Uh, and the idea was to remove what we called a postcode or zip code lottery of healthcare. So if you lived in a certain area of the UK, you could have some treatment, but if you lived in another area, you couldn't. Um, because it wasn't funded. And so by developing guidelines in various areas of uh, healthcare where there was good evidence, it would hopefully remove that lottery as to how you were treated. And the most important factor uh, in the statement uh, is this one word. It was independent. It was at arm's length, even though financed by government, it was at arm's length from government. And so that gave it some credence as to whatever guideline was produced, there were no ulterior motives, there were, it wasn't financially driven by any corporation or um, any company. Whatever was produced by NICE was um, just based on solid fact, where possible. So this is the man who introduced it. Uh, you can see Ch Cherry Blair there's very happy because uh, Tony's just told her he's gonna get some, she's gonna get some new curtains when they move into that uh, house. And uh, he's uh, already thinking about uh, how to set up NICE and make himself more popular with us uh, physicians. The core principles of NICE, other than obviously to, ensure, to make, ensure that patients received good health care, was to base those guidelines on what evidence was out there, was to involve patients and their advocates in the development of these guidelines, so they had a voice, was to look at new technology that was available, was to ensure inclusion of um, companies that were providing those technologies, was to look at pharmaceutical uh, advancements and development at the time. But first of all, you've got to select a topic. And how is that done? Well, in the UK, a um, research nurse called Eileen Scott uh, kept pushing and kept submitting her idea to have a guideline in interruptive hypothermia, the prevention of. And it took her about three years of applying through the um, Department of Health and through NICE until it was finally uh, accepted that we would go ahead and develop a guideline on this subject. It's still very much the same format. This was back in 2004. It's still very much the same format for guideline development. You submit an idea to this institution and they, uh, a group, a body will look at it and its uh, relevance and validity uh, for applying to the UK. But NICE is now very aware that its guidelines are crossing boundaries. Countries around the world now look at NICE 
and what has been developed by NICE and are implementing those guidelines into their own countries. It now has an international technical team that actually will go over to a country when asked to develop a particular guideline if so requested. So the development, the process development, starts with appointing a group of people, a technical team. Uh, there were seven, in 2006, there were seven centres in the UK. They're now, uh, they've been amalgamated into four centres. They're known as collaborating centres, and they provide uh, staff who will start doing the Medline research uh, and looking, at, looking for random controlled trials, as well as statisticians, and then pulling in health economists, and you'll hear from one of them, Sarah Davis, in a minute, uh, after myself. So then you need to appoint a chair for the guideline, and uh, it, was a hard for, uh, it was a fought process. Somebody else thought they should have had the job, but uh, I won out in the end. Um, and then once I was appointed, we then all sat down and had to come up with what we called a scope. Now, a scope looked at what were our inclusions into this guideline and what we were going to exclude. And the exclusion was just as important. So we decided that we weren't going to put in obstetric patients because there wasn't enough evidence at the time. We weren't going to include um, patients who were obviously having intentional hypothermia. <coughs> Uh, because that was outside the remit of this guideline. And we came up with an initial draft scope that went, then was presented to the stakeholders. Now, stakeholders in every country will include yourselves, your interested parties. It may include the surgeons. It, may inclu it will include uh, the uh, technology companies, because they will have an interest in uh, what the guideline says at the end of the day. It may include pharmaceutical companies, pharmaceutical companies, but most importantly, it will include patients and patient groups and advocates. And at the moment in the UK, there are about 170 stakeholders registered with NICE, so they will draw upon those that are relevant to that particular guideline. <coughs> so having put out the scope to the stakeholders, it was then time to start forming a group to examine this guideline. And so we got people around the table. Uh, it was a selection process of those who we knew were interested in, the, um, in this particular field, in this subject, uh, who were taught on it on a national basis, who had published uh, uh, on it, but most importantly, who were UK-based. They had to be UK-based. And it included nurses. Uh, we, have, um, we have technicians called anaesthetic assistants or operating department assistants who have degrees in in how to assist anesthesiologists, that's particular to the UK. They were included. Uh, obviously, we had, we had a representative uh, from the Royal College of Anesthetists, a representative from the Association of Anesthetists, uh, myself uh, as an anesthesiologist. Uh, and we then started to meet up. Now, I thought, there's so much evidence out there, this is going to take six months. We're going to have this wrapped up in six months. And I couldn't understand why the head of the uh, technical group kept laughing at me. Because in the end, it took 18 months. Because there was so much evidence to sift, sift through, so much research to look at, that we started to meet, and we met, and we met, and we met every two months. And between those two-month meetings, we would have a huge amount of research analysis to undertake at home, um, looking at forest plots. And all of this was generated and developed by the technical team, then sent out to all those in the development group, guideline development group, to examine before the next meeting. And I kid you not, it took 18 months to, to just to get through the evidence. We decided at the very start of this development, and this is something that you would, if you were going to develop a guideline, you would need to do, <coughs> is to look at the key topic areas. And we broke it down into seven topics as listed on the board. Our group, our big group was then split up into smaller groups and we were allocated a couple of topics each. And so looking at the evidence, it was much easier then to focus on that particular area that we were allocated, that each, each person was allocated and so focus very well and not be distracted by other evidence. And I think that was, um, that was one of the strongest parts of the development was just focusing on your, your key topic. The role of this development group, is, as listed, 
Um, the most important for the clinicians was to answer the, those questions that the scope was asking as to the relevance of a, of, um, the, uh, of a guideline in this, um, in this field, in this area. Consensus was quite important because there were certain areas that we couldn't answer, that we can now, four years down the line from, from when it was published. But at the time, in 2008, when we were writing up the guideline, there were certain areas that, that uh, we didn't have answers for. And we had to come up with consensus for that, consensus uh, answers. So the guideline, if you want to look it up, on the, it's freely available. It's on the internet. You just have to go to the NICE website. You just type in, in the search engine CG65. That's its number. We were one of the first anesthetic guidelines to be produced by NICE. It came up with um, a few, uh, there were, I want to go through a few issues with you, a few pointers about it that I think were quite important about it. One of the first ones was about preoperative information. Telling your patients, telling your patients relatives, bring warm clothes with you. If you're coming into hospital, don't just bring some uh, uh, pajamas, bring in a dressing gown. Bring in um, some slippers, all right? Information leaflets on how to stay warm. Don't just um, throw on a sweater, wear a sweater in bed, okay, a jumper. Simple things that people don't think about because they think the hospital's going to provide it. And if your hospital does, then I think that's excellent. But unfortunately in the NHS, um, there, there isn't enough funding for, necessarily to provide those, those items. So inform your patients, make them advocates, all right, especially relatives as well. If your mother's going into hospital or your father, you would look after them. Now they wouldn't necessarily remember to pack all those things, you'd do it for them. So, information, very, very important, before you've even started the process of uh, admitting a patient to hospital. Assessing the patient. Now, we found that a lot of uh, data that was being, was being described in the literature as preoperative blood, um, preoperative temperatures was actually being taken in preoperative clinics. Now, that bears no resemblance when a patient attends a clinic two weeks before they're due to come into hospital when they're fully clothed, a temperature then bears no resemblance to when they're just about to go to the operating room. So we, we decided the temperature must be taken in the hour before they attend surgery. So it gives a true reflection on what the temperature should be. And if they were cold, if they were less, as defined by our guideline, less than 36 <coughs> degrees, then they shouldn't go for surgery. They should be warmed until their temperature was above 36 <coughs> degrees. And you've heard enough compelling reasons not to operate on that, not to start anesthesia, let alone operate. Don't start, why you shouldn't start anesthesia on a patient who has a temperature of less than 36 degrees. You're not doing them any favors at all. It might be convenient for the surgeon, it might be convenient for the patient not to be postponed for an hour or two. But if they end up with a wound infection afterwards, then they're not gonna thank you for it. How do you measure the temperature? When do you measure the temperature? We've uh, We've discussed that. Assessment also covers whether they have any risk factors. Now, there's a table in, uh, in the guideline that uh, describes the risk factors to you. But in, in essence, it's if patients had an a have an ASA of anything more than two, if, they have, uh, if they're about to undergo general and regional anesthesia, if they're about to have an intra-abdominal surgery, if they're already cold, these are risk factors. And if they have two or more risk factors, then you need to warm them from the start of anesthesia. This is the magic number that we came up with. There was a lot, big debate about whether it should be 36.5 or 36, but we felt that with the variability in measurements at the time, with, with the technology available to, um, to clinicians at the time when we were writing the guidelines, to say 36.5 would exclude half the popul surgical population in the world. Uh, and we felt that it was totally impractical, so we we came up with 36, and that was based upon the measurements used in research, in the research studies. And then we also said, transfer to theatres. Why get a patient to go on a trolley, or a gurney, I think, uh, as they call them in the States? Get them to walk to theatres. They generate heat, muscular activity. If they can walk to theatres, make them walk. And most of our patients do, in fact, walk to theatres. A, um, a, a lot of hospitals have holding areas where they're then transported. It's not practical there. But where practical, if they're coming from a ward, get them to walk where possible. Now, once you're in theatre, two, two concepts came out that were very important to us. 
First of all, we talked about anesthesia time. Not surgical time, that's relevant. It's anesthesia time. Patients start getting cold from the start of anesthesia, not from the start of surgery. So as soon as you've given your anesthetic, or even if you've used midazolam as pre-med, which is part of your anesthetic, they're going to start to get cold. So if your anesthetic time is more than 30 minutes, you should warm them. Okay? Now that is just about every procedure that is undertaken by a surgeon, excluding maybe cystoscopies, which can be very quick, um, and uh, the one or two gynecological procedures. But just about every procedure undertaken by surgeons is going to have an anesthetic time that's longer than 30 minutes. And again, this is based on, you, can see, you saw the evidence on the graphs that have been shown earlier uh, this, this afternoon. Keep the ambient temperature in the theatre up. It will help save heat loss from the patient. Warm the patient. Measure their temperature every 30 minutes. I'm sure none of you take a blood pressure at the beginning of surgery and say, right, it's great, it's fine, I'm not going to bother taking it again until the end of surgery. You take it every five minutes. Now, you don't need to take somebody's temperature every five minutes because it's not going to change that, uh, that quickly. But if you're actively warming a patient, you need to know that you're not cooking them. You need to know that they're not starting to get too hot. And you're only going to find that out by measuring their temperature. So we really stress that point. You must measure the temperature. And this is, I think, one of the flaws in um, this is one of being the biggest obstacles in introducing this guideline into the UK in full, in that because of the unreliability of temperature measurement up till now, especially when using a laryngeal mask airway or regional techniques, we as anesthetists don't necessarily measure temperature, uh, except maybe once, in the, once at induction and then at the end. And then we find the, temperatures temp uh, the patient has a temperature of 37.5 or even 38 degrees, and they're really uncomfortable uh, when they go through to recovery. We mentioned fluids. The guideline says warm fluids that are, uh, if you're giving more than 500 mils of crystalloid. It's very unusual just to give one unit of blood or two units of blood. You've probably given crystalloid as well. If you're giving more than 500 mils, then warm the fluids. And you'll, um, and you'll hear why from the next speaker um, on an economic point, um, from an economic point of view. It's actually cheaper to do that than it is not to warm them, surprisingly enough. Post-op, keep them warm. Um, don't let them go back to the ward until, from the recovery room until their temperature is above 36 degrees because they'll just get cold on the ward. Keep measuring the temperature again. In the UK, there is a guideline that we have from the Association of Anesthetists that says a patient must be in recovery room in the PACU for 30 minutes. <coughs> So the temperature is measured just when they come into the PACU. We then suggested it should be measured at 15 minutes to make sure they're not getting cold or they're getting too hot, and then measured on, on leaving so as part of the care plan to ensure that they're fit for discharge to the ward or, uh, in some cases, to a, a holding area after, uh, after surgery. On the ward, if they're going to be staying in for a period of time, then they need to have their temperature measured, just as their blood pressure and pulse would be measured. We've got to get into this mindset that temperature is actually one of those measurements that should be taken every time you measure a blood pressure um, over a period of time. So if you're doing it, so we suggested every four hours. We don't want to make uh, nurses are busy. They're busy people. They've got to look at wounds. They've got to look at dressings. They've got to look at uh, um, the uh, containers, vacuum containers, etc. They've got lots of things to do and take patients to the OR. So you can't ask them realistically to be measuring temperatures on all the surgical patients every hour. We felt four hours was a good enough uh, period, time period. All honeymoons, unfortunately, come to an end. And so it happened to Mr. Blair. And it's also happened to NICE. NICE is not without controversy. It's produced guidelines that haven't gone down well with the public. Um, our guideline on perioperative hypothermia hasn't always gone down well with uh, theatre managers who have started to complain that it disrupts the flow of patients because the patient's temperature is lower than 36 on the ward and they're not allowed to come down to the operating room. But we have argued back, especially in my institution where I work, that they're not fit for surgery. If that patient was hypertensive, you wouldn't send for them. You'd get them treated. If that patient had a tachycardia that's treat, uh, or an SVT, you wouldn't, bring, you wouldn't send for them they're in atrial fibrillation with a rate of 120, you'd get them treated. So their temperature's less than 36, 
They should be treated for it. It just leads me to say that when you develop a guideline, don't forget, it doesn't substitute clinical acumen. A guideline does not replace clinical judgment. Okay? It helps direct you. It helps... Uh, it allows you to educate and it allows you to bring your interested parties on board, especially if it's come from a national organisation. But it is no substitution for clinical judgment. So this is the guideline um, that you can download from the internet. Um, it's the shorter version. I would ask you all to have a look at it. Um, as you're all sitting here, you all have an interest in the subject. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>